Welcome back to another edition in the Beyond Addiction series. In this particular session, I would like to share a topic with you entitled Chain Reaction, Understanding Addiction. This we're going to do in two parts. And before we can get to understanding the neurobiology and the chemistry involved in addiction as it happens in the brain, we first have to, have to understand how the brain works under normal conditions. You need to know the true so that you can pick out the counterfeit. Does that make sense to you? So what we're going to do in this session is go through how the brain operates in a very basic, very easy to understand manner. And then in our next session, we're going to take these uh, introductory concepts and we're going to tie them in and apply them to the problem of addiction. You may experience the pleasures of a drug, the euphoria, physically, but it's happening in the reward pathway of the brain. You may experience the withdrawal and the negative sides of addiction physically, but there's something that's happening inside of the brain. We want to understand the neuro neurobiology of how addiction works. So in this episode, we will put together the chain reaction and the neurobiology of the healthy brain so that we can understand we've got the control to compare with the aberrant uh, practices of the, of the addicted brain. So the first thing to understand in terms of the neurobiology of how your brain works is that there are different areas or lobes that scientists have identified. These different areas perform different functions. Each quadrant, each lobe does its own thing, and together as each one does its work, each department inside the brain, if you like, the whole company is able to run effectively. So here's the first area of the brain you should know about. That is the parietal lobe. The parietal lobe handles such things as temperature control, taste, touch, body movement, visuospatial processing, reading and arithmetic, all that complex stuff that requires uh, arithmetic, you know, the adding and the subtracting and all that. Top part of your brain, spatial orientation, uh, all of that. The top part, the top lobe of the brain. Then right at the back, we have what we call the occipital lobe. The occipital lobe is the area in which uh, vision is interpreted. So your eyes are like the lens on a camera. Your eyes receive light that is reflected off of objects. That light comes in through the camera lens. It goes down the optical nerve, which passes the information to the occipital lobe. And it's actually there at the back of your brain that you interpret this light into what you call vision. You see color there. You see your visual processing takes place there. And that's why uh, if you get a hard knock to the back of the head, though they didn't touch your eyes in the accident or whatever the case may be, you may lose your sight. That area of the brain is damaged. It can no longer interpret the light signals coming in through the lens of the eye and through the optical nerve. Then we have the cerebellum. The cerebellum takes care of all those things you don't even think about. The cerebellum integrates sensory perception and motor control. Motor control is not driving your car. Motor control is the use of your arms and legs, movement of arms and legs. So for instance, someone throws a ball at you. The sensory information says, here is coming a ball, traveling at approximately X number of kilometers or meters per hour or per second. You have to then place your hand in front of your face to stop that ball from colliding with your nose. You need to close your fingers at just the right moment in time. The cerebellum is the one that helps you to coordinate coordinate all of that without any conscious thought. Someone throws a ball, it's almost like instinct. You stick your hand up, you grab it. Cerebellum helps you do that. The balance and equilibrium and your posture, all handled by the cerebellum. You don't think about sitting up straight over a period of your lifetime. You are forming a habit. At first, it's conscious, and then eventually the cerebellum takes it over, and it's sort of programmed into the cerebellum, the posture with which you sit, keeping your balance, and all the rest of it. Then you get the temporal lobe. The temporal lobe is responsible for hearing, for the interpretation of sound, which comes in through the, the ear's devices. It takes care of some aspects of your memory, and then you have the language and speech abilities, which is all controlled by the temporal lobe. 
Now, what you will notice is that uh, while there may be elements that are slightly different in these areas uh, between different people, I mean, for instance, the temporal lobe in someone who speaks German is programmed for the German language. Someone like myself who speaks English, well, it's programmed for English. But basically, these areas of the brain so far are a dime a dozen. We all have them and they all work in the same way, although the variables under which they work may be slightly different, but they all do the same thing. Language, hearing, touch, taste, smell, temperature control, reading, arithmetic. You know, it, the, the language might vary and the pronunciation might vary, but all these areas of the brain is the same for me as they are for you, provided we both have brains that are fully functional. Are you with me so far? These areas of the brain don't make me uniquely who I am. But there is an area of the brain that is responsible for your personality and for your character, for making you the individual that nobody else in this universe can be. There, there is an area of the brain which is like your, your unique uh, neurobiological fingerprint, only one of it in the entire universe of God, and that is the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe handles conscious thought. It handles your reasoning abilities, your judgment, your foresight, your character and morality issues, the spirituality. You can understand how that combination of things makes you who you are. So the, the frontal lobe of your brain is the one you want to guard at all costs. The frontal lobe is what makes you, you, and me, me. If I was able to do a frontal lobe lobotomy, take your frontal lobe and exchange it with mine, you would have my uh, language abilities, but, but you would be you in my brain. <laughs> so you would think in my language, you would do reading and arithmetic like I do it, you would see like I see, but you would still be you. My frontal lobe in your brain would mean that I, in your body and in your brain, would be making the value decisions that I would normally have made, but I would be speaking your language, hearing like you hear, see like you seeing. Does that make sense to you? The frontal lobe is what makes you unique. It makes you special. The rest of the brain regions are simply the servant of the frontal lobe. The reason you have sight, the reason you have taste, the reason you have speech and language and all that stuff, the reason you need posture and balance and movement abilities is simply because the rest of the brain handles the instructions of the frontal lobe. In the frontal lobe, that's where you consciously process, evaluate, make judgment decisions, decide between right and wrong. That's morality. Where you decide whether you are going to have a relationship with God, whether you believe in God, whether you're going to practice spirituality. Frontal lobe is where it's all at. The frontal lobe is your unique neurobiological fingerprint. No one else like you in the world because of your frontal lobe. You see, the frontal lobe, what I'm trying to highlight here, is desperately in need of protection. It's desperately in need of development. Here is where you happens inside the frontal lobe. We want to make sure that we protect and encourage healthy development of the frontal lobe. When you watch the 7 o'clock news, or when you look at somebody who you know who is a drug addict, and then you ask yourself, did any of these things change? Did, what's happening in society that the 7 o'clock news reads like it reads? Why is it that drug addicts make poor judgment decisions? They have no foresight. They can't reason from cause to effect. They go from one fix to the next. They'll compromise their moral ethics. They'll begin to steal, to cheat, to lie. They'll begin to sleep around. They lose even that sense of morality. You look at the seven o'clock news. What is it that makes news? Is it not the fact that in society we are being told loud and clear that there is a major frontal lobe malfunction that's taking place? Is it not true that the seven o'clock news is testimony to the fact that people are not taking care of their frontal lobes? People are not developing their frontal lobes properly? Indeed, our spirituality is going down the tubes. Our morality is going down the tubes. Our, our character, our solid uh, principle-based character is going down the tubes. Our, our ability to reason, our judgment decisions, our foresight, our conscious thought. People are just not thinking clearly. People are not acting clearly because their brains are not functioning right. 
We're pumping ourselves full of all sorts of chemicals in our food, all the wrong types of food. We're not giving the brain the nutrition that it needs. We're not giving it the exercise, the body, the physical exercise that it needs. We're not drinking good water anymore. We're stuffing ourselves full of, of, of uh, pleasure-inducing chemicals. We call them drugs. We're abusing these substances. We're caffeinating ourselves. We're tobaccoing ourselves. We're alcoholing ourselves. We are cocaining ourselves. We're doing all sorts of stuff, and it's messing with the brain chemistry in the frontal lobe. What do you mean, Adrian? How is the frontal no lobe connected to this? Ah, check this out. Right in the center of your brain, right down in the core of, of what you are, is three brain regions. One is the ventral tegmental area, known as the VTA. The other is the nucleus accumbens. And the other is the what? The prefrontal cortex. In other words, we're talking about here the frontal lobe. These three areas are joined together in what is known as the reward pathway. It is an area of the brain which contains a number of brain nerves. A brain nerve is technical, technically called a neuron. Now that's not moron, it's neuron. So you have a whole lot of neurons inside of the brain there, and in this reward pathway, it's specifically the neurons that store, release, and react to a neurotransmitter, a brain chemical called dopamine. Dopamine is what gives you, ah, the reward sensation when I take drugs. It's that chemical which makes you feel good and experience pleasure. It's the reason we persist in taking drugs, because we activate the reward pathway. Part of the reward pathway is the prefrontal cortex. So we mess with the dopamine balance in the prefrontal cortex, and dopamine is one of those chemicals, as we'll see in a little while, that's implicated in attention and learning and uh, the ability to apply oneself in motivation and reward. So when I'm messing with that neurochemistry as well as all the other systems, guess what happens? I change the functioning of the frontal lobe. So I experience pleasure, but in ex experiencing that kind of inordinate pleasure, we also change the way we think, we change the way we operate, and our morality changes, our character changes, our spirituality changes, our ability to reason from cause to effect changes, our ability to have foresight, conscious choice changes, or conscious, conscious thought changes. Can you understand how when we're messing with the chemistry of the brain, we're going to mess with the frontal lobe, and that has the power to fundamentally change who you are. It doesn't just make you feel good. You, when you are taking these chemicals, will begin to change the healthy brain into the addicted brain, and the addicted brain malfunctions in the frontal lobe. And when it's malfunctioning in the frontal lobe, you will cease to be who you are. You will become a different person. So to you who are a parent and you're wondering what happened to your child, your child somehow is not there anymore until they get off of that substance, until they clear out the brain and the chemistry comes back. That person has changed. That person is gone because that brain has changed the way it works. But there is hope, friends. There is hope. That's the point of this entire series, so stay tuned. The brain is a complex network of individual nerve cells. They do not physically connect with one another. Now, here's a problem. Your brain works on measurable current flow. They say between 10 and 23 watts of electricity is produced inside of the brain, enough to power, power up a little light bulb. So how is it that electricity flows through the circuitry of the brain, through the wires of the brain, which is, in fact, a, uh, the neuronal system, the nerve system, when none of them physically connect? You know, if you've done science at school, you will know that electricity requires a closed circuit. That's why when you flip the switch of your lights, the lights come on because you close the circuit. And you flip it the other way, that, that uh, closed circuit opens, the electrons can't flow, the light doesn't work. You shouldn't be alive. You shouldn't be thinking because the wiring of your, sis of your brain is not connected, but you require electricity for what you know is the human experience of thought and emotion and feeling and everything else it means to be human. So how is it that your brain operates? Ah, this is where it gets interesting. On the screen you see a sort of a, a schematic diagram of an artistic impression of how a neuron uh, works. It's of course very simplified here. You have little fingers called dendrites which receive signal. It's processed in the cell body. It goes down through the axon. It gets to the terminal. Now that's where the electrical signal should die. And it does die you'll see there that there are little yellow balls which represent a chemical, a, a brain chemical, a communicating chemical. That's why we call it a neurobrain transmitter communicator, a neurotransmitter. 
And here's basically what happens in the process of neurotransmission. Electrical signal flows down the presynaptic neuron, the originating neuron. It gets to the terminal where it is converted into a chemical communicator, a neurotransmitter, which floats across the gap between the two neurons. That gap is called the synapse. It floats across the synapse, and then it connects to the dendrites on the receiving neuron, okay, the postsynaptic the, the, the neuron that's after the synapse. Those little chemicals are received by the dendrites of the postsynaptic neuron, and they are changed back into electrical signal. Electrical becomes chemical, becomes electrical, becomes chemical, becomes electrical, becomes chemical. Hundreds of thousands of time, every waking and sleeping moment of your life, with hundreds of different types of neurotransmitters in there, doing all sorts of different stuff. And that's what it means to be human. <laughs> I mean, it is phenomenal. I don't know how any neuroscientist could possibly believe in the theory of evolution. There are just too many little dynamics in the complexity of the brain, let alone all sorts of other evidences in nature, that tell you there had to be an intelligent design behind that. It could not just happen by mistake, not even over millions of years. So here is a picture of a stained neuron, compliments of the Wikipedia online uh, um, encyclopedia, and if you've ever been along the seashore and you've walked by the water and you've found blue bottles, a little creature that's washed up out of the sea, has long little tentacles with a big blue bubble that those tentacles are connected to, you'll notice that's pretty much what your brain looks like on the inside. You have the cell body with these little tentacles that go down, the axons, and they reach out and they try and make connection with other little dendrites, the other little fingers, but they don't actually connect. There's the synapse between them in which the chemical communication takes place. Here's a beautiful picture picture here. Uh, this is from the som somatosensory cortex of the macaque monkey, and uh, also on the other one, neurons in the cerebral cortex, and it just shows you very clearly. You can see the cell body, and then you can see how the little web goes out to try and make connections, like a, a computer network. The one on the right-hand side there, you can see very clearly the cell body with the dendrites coming out there, and then the long, thin axons. It looks almost like a tree, if you like, with the stem and the roots planted down below, and the axon that comes up with the branches at the top which goes out to make connection with other roots that are up above it, if you can imagine something like that. So here is a little schematic which represents the, the close-up of the synapse, the end of the presynaptic neuron with the synapse and then the start of the dendrites of the postsynaptic neuron. We have our neurotransmitters there, we have our uh, receivers there represented by those little blue pots, and we want to show you how this actually works, but one more piece of the story first. Uh, your brain is constantly producing new chemicals, new neurotransmitters. However, it needs and it believes in the process of recycling. Now, recycling is a big concept in our world today. Everybody understands recycling. It's the process whereby you take things that can be reused and you set them aside and somebody comes along and takes them and reprocesses them and reuses them for something new. Your brain is constantly producing new chemicals but not fast enough to use it once and destroy it. Just like I don't earn enough money to buy a new car every day, I buy one car every who knows how many years, and I have to recycle that car every day. So today I take it out of the garage, I go do my errands, take it for a drive, come back, park it in the garage tonight. Tomorrow I do the same thing, I take it out of the same garage, take the same car, go for the same drive, do my thing, come back, park it in the same garage. Third day, do the same thing again and again. The brain does the same thing with neurotransmitters. It takes them out of their little vesicle of storage, out of the garage, takes them for a drive, parks them in the parking bay, which is our receptors on the uh, dendrites of the postsynaptic neuron. They cause reaction there, electrical chemical flows, then they are released from that parking bay, they drive back to their garage, and they get parked there for use later on. As simple as that. Does that make sense to you? And so that's how the recycling process works. So here comes an electrical signal. It comes down through the presynaptic neuron, moderate amount of neurotransmitters released, binds to the postsynaptic dendrites, moderate firing of postsynaptic neuron, then it is recycled and parked back in the garage for later use. That is what is happening all the time inside of your brain as you are processing information, hearing, seeing, touching, feeling, thinking, all by electrochemical recycling and it reactions taking place inside of your brain. Now, there are a few families of neurotransmitters I simply need to introduce you to in the healthy brain because they are the ones that are of particular relevance when it comes to the matter of addiction. These are the systems which are used and abused by drugs. The first one is serotonin. Have you ever heard of serotonin before? 
It's one of the more well-known neurotransmitters. It is distributed throughout the brain and the spinal cord, and the serotonin system is involved in, and here are some key words for you, the control of behavior, which means if I have too much serotonin or too little serotonin, it's going to change the way I act, behavior. Perceptual systems, perception is how you see the world around you. And because too much or too little of serotonin will change the way you see the world around you, that's why it alters your behavior as well. If I walk into a room and I see you as my friend and not as a threat, I'll stretch out my hand, I will greet you, we will shake hands, and we will be happy together. If however I walk into a room and I perceive, perceive you to be a thief, you are breaking in, you intend to do me harm, I'm not going to smile at you and I'm not going to shake your hand. I'm going to do all in my power to, well, uh, disable you. So how I see the world around me is going to determine how I react to the world around me. So if I am messing with brain chemistry and that aspect is changed, it's going to change the way I react to the world around me. It's also affecting the regulatory systems, which include things such as mood. Have you noticed when people take drugs, their moods go haywire? Uh, hunger. Have you noticed that when people take drugs, sometimes they want to eat the house out and at other times they won't eat for days? Uh, it is involved in body temperature. Common thread that we'll show you as we study the various drugs all the way through changes blood pressure, changes body temperature readings. All of that is changed. Sexual behavior. Now, there's an area that doesn't get affected by drug use, right? <laughs> Definitely not. You will notice that people in that hedonistic state will just want to have sexual intercourse and sexual relations with, well, just about anyone or anything that walks past their, their path that looks interesting and that uh, might be able to feel good with. Sexual behavior is changed. Muscle control. Have you noticed that when people are withdrawing from drugs, they sometimes experience cramps even when they're high on their drugs? Muscle control changes. Sensory perception, as we've described, uh, what I'm seeing, what I'm hearing. When I mess with that, I may cause short circuits which is responsible for hallucinations and illusions and things of that nature. So change the serotonin system, change the way the brain works. Another family that you need to know about is the endorphin family. Endorphins are endogenous, opioid, biochemical compounds. Whew, what did that just mean? In other words, endorphins are naturally, internally, natively occurring brain transmitters that do what? Resemble the opiates Opiates sounds a lot like opium. What do we get from opium? Well, we make heroin from opium, we make morphine from opium, we make codeine from opium, powerful painkillers also, drugs that are used in the recreational drug scene. Why? Because they have the ability to pr produce analgesia. Fancy word for it kills pain. It takes away discomfort and it creates a sense of well-being. So endorphins are your body's natural feel-good hormone or feel-good neurotransmitter. They are your body's natural opium, your body's natural heroin, your body's natural codeine. They, they, they take away the sensation of pain, give you a sense of well-being. What does this tell us? It tells us two things. Number one, God designed you to experience pleasure. God intended for you not to have pain. He intended for you to enjoy life. He intended for you to have a sense of well-being. Uh, so first of all, we know that God is a God of pleasure. God loves us to have a good time. But he has created boundaries in which this pleasure is to be experienced for our own good. Which brings me to point number two. Although God intends for us to have pleasure, how do drugs work? Drugs don't invent new systems. Drugs come along and hijack God-given systems. In other words, when you take an opiate substance which works on the endorphin system, it's not creating a new thing inside of you. It's simply coming along and hijacking the opiate system that's already there. You already have opiate-like naturally occurring, natively occurring chemicals inside of your brain. And if that system wasn't there, you could take as much opium-based drugs as you want, and it would have no effect on you. Are you with me so far? So it's like you're driving along in your car. You stop at a traffic light one night, and lo and behold, before you realize it, someone's at the driver's door with a gun telling you to get out of the car. He doesn't have his own system of transportation, so he is forcefully hijacking that car, that transportation. He chucks you out. If you're lucky, you escape with your life. But there goes your car, hijacked to be taken for a ride by who knows who, who has no respect for that vehicle. And if you're lucky enough to see it again, you'd probably wish you didn't see it again because it's going to be ruined and wrecked. 
That's what drugs do inside of your brain. They hijack the natural vehicles that God has placed there for our enjoyment so that we don't have pain, so that we have a sense of pleasure. It, over, uh, it, it abuses them, it overrides them, it destroys them, and it hands them back to you in a destroyed condition. And that's why you keep seeking out the drugs, because after that system has been ruined, it doesn't function properly anymore unless it's kick-started by the drug hijacking the system again. So God designed you for pleasure. He designed you to have a good time in life, but He designed it within healthy parameters, which drugs cross the line of, hijack the God-given system, abuse it, and destroy it in the process. Last family I must tell you about is, of course, dopamine. Dopamine has many functions in the brain. Here are your key words, including important roles in behavior, cognition. Cognition is the way we think, our thought patterns, thought process, motor activity, the moving of my arms and my legs and the like, motivation and reward, as we've already explained in relation to the reward pathway, uh, regulation of milk production for the ladies, sleep, mood, attention and learning. Even in the case of ADD, attention deficit disorder, and ADHD, attention, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, one of the key players that have been identified as malfunctioning in that area of the brain that has to do with learning and memory is, guess what, the dopamine molecules. Too little dopamine, or whatever the case may be. So, drugs are administered to stimulate the release of dopamine to encourage healthy functioning of the brain in those areas. Of course, those drugs put you at the same risk as any of the other drugs that operate in a similar way. And in the next section, we'll go into more detail about that so that you can understand some of the risks that are involved there. So dopamine is our feel-good uh, neurotransmitter. It's the one which we're going to talk about the most in the rest of the series going forward because that's one we're going to use as a model to understand how the drugs use and abuse the systems of the brain. God has given you a wonderful organ, a wonderful thing called the mind, called the brain. And he's given it and entrusted it to us that we may take care of it, nurture it, and help it to grow and develop. The bottom line, as the psalmist one wrote, once wrote, is that you formed me, speaking to God, you formed my inward parts, you covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. Very clearly, friends, God has designed you in a magnificent way. Your whole body, your whole brain has the, the fingerprints of the Almighty God all over it. He has given you a unique neurobiological fingerprint called the frontal lobe, which makes you unique and special like no other person on earth. He's put together this network of, of wiring and of chemicals on an, and of electrical signaling, which not even the most complex and most advanced computer system, which is designed with, with designers and with intelligence behind it, has even come close to equaling. How would we ever begin to think that we came about as a result of chance and natural selection and evolutionary accident? No, 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 friends. Our whole mind testifies to the fact of a loving creator who designed us in his image that we may enter into relationship with him. He's given us our mind because it is the divine human interface module that enables us to have a relationship with him. Through the frontal lobe, he's able to communicate with us and enter into relationship with us. We're able to perceive his presence and respond to him appropriately. God has given us a wonderful mind. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. There's no one in the universe uh, like you. You are unique and you are special. God has a special plan for you. In our next segment, we will show you what happens when we take this wonderful organism that God has designed us uh, as and created us, uh, given us to, to us as a gift, and we abuse it with addictive substances, with pleasure-seeking substances. Now that you understand how the healthy brain works, how fearfully and wonderfully and delicately you are made, you will realize uh, you do not want to take this system and abuse it manually. It is a dangerous dangerous thing to do. In our next segment, we'll unpack uh, the neurobiology of the addicted brain. Let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, will you bless the viewer? Will you just fill them with a sense of awe for who you are and for how you've designed them? Will you help them to draw close to you and to surrender their mind and their heart to you, that they may know the joy of this full and unreserved surrender to you? May they find this brain just unfolding as you turn all the right genes on as you press all the right buttons and that mind unfolds and we begin to enter into this joyous experience of fellowship with you. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.